Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, it's a privilege, a privilege and an honor uh, to be here. I, I can't say it's a joy because I'm terribly intimidated by the size of this crowd, but um, I'm used to having intimate conversations in the work I do with educators. I hope that we will have some opportunity to have intimate conversations after this, this is over. Um, I, it's, a, it's a privilege and a joy in part because I've been to New Zealand before and, and I've been incredibly impressed by the, the commitment, the seriousness, the independent mindedness of educators here. I don't know if you appreciate but uh, just how unique it is, the, uh, the sense of ownership and agency that New Zealand educators have. Uh, but just in case you think I'm just uh, trying to cheap, uh, cheap compliments to ingratiate myself to the audience, I want to critique you and to say that you're also much too nice and polite and it's very disconcerting if you come from an argumentative culture uh, it, it, like that of Israel uh, to, to talk to people who, who uh, agree with everything you say. So I hope you, you'll make me feel at home by disagreeing with me and uh, by questioning, critiquing, confronting, protesting what I do. Uh, and if you don't feel like shouting out in the middle of the talk, uh, which would make me feel wonderful. Uh, you, uh, you, you know, put, put up your, your questions, your comments, your critiques on Twitter or on that Google Doc, and I'll, I'll be looking at it afterwards and, and perhaps even be able to address some of those I issues today. I hope it's the beginning of a conversation which will continue uh, beyond the next hour and 15 minutes. Um, I'm going to talk about the culture of professional discourse. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, it mainly a, a, a critique of the existing professional discourse among teachers in Israel and in England where I have experience. I don't have experience in New Zealand that much, uh, so don't, you know, don't take it personally uh, if I say things which are critical. And I'm very interested to hear how things are different here in, in as much as they're different. Um, it, it's a, mainly a critique but also a prescription and I'll talk about some of the things that we're doing now in Israel to try to uh, change professional discourse and the, the culture of professional discourse. Just one uh, housekeeping note, I will be making the slides available uh, both at, on my own website, you can see there, dialogicpedagogy.com uh, and, uh, and through the, the conference organizers. So here's what I'm going to do, I'm going to address four questions. First of all, why care? about teacher professional conversations. Um, and I'll, I'll make a, an argument that this is a, perhaps more important, to, that we should care more about what happens in informal teacher professional conversations than we do in formal learning uh, uh, occasions the teachers are engaged in. Secondly, what do we talk about when we talk about our practice? Uh, what goes on? What are the norms uh, through which we talk about our practice? What's the culture? And what are we talking about? And, and, and again, I'll, I'll present a bit of a critique here. And then after that, I'll talk about what sort of professional conversations make us smarter about our practice, uh, what sort of conversations should we be engaging in, uh, suggesting some alternative uh, norms, and then so what? So you know, what can you take back from this talk to your school if you're persuaded? And again, I hope I won't persuade all of you. So uh, why teach your professional conversations? Um, I start with two propositions. Uh, the first is that sometimes a group is smarter than its individual members. So the, the whole is greater than the sum of its smarts. Uh, you have here a picture of Building 20, uh, an MIT campus, very famous building known as the Magical Incubator. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it was uh, the radiation lab, the RAD lab set up during World War II. And uh, it, it, there were nine Nobel Prize winners who worked there over the course of its, uh, 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 I, I think about 20 years that it was active. It, it was uh, the place where Noam Chomsky had his office, it, 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 where Donald Sean, you mentioned before, worked there, Seymour Papert. Uh, it was the magical incubator for all sorts of reasons. One of it was a temporary structure. So you had people who were temporary there, who, who weren't yet established and part of the university hierarchy. And it also was very flexible. You could drill holes in the walls, you could tear down walls, you could do whatever you wanted. And that, that created all sorts of spaces for uh, for communication and for, for conversations that made everyone smarter. And then for that reason, everyone wanted to work in this magical incubator. On the other hand, it, sometimes the opposite is the case. The group is not as smart as each of its members and indeed causes them to act stupidly. And here you have a picture of my own building that I work in. Um, it's it's uh, very nice looking from the outside in the desert in southern Israel. Um, and well, I won't say which building I'm going to talk about, but um, it, it, there, there I've worked in a number of academic departments where you have some extremely smart people, individually smart. In fact, they excel at being smart individually. 
But when you put them together in a room, say in a departmental meeting, they act so stupidly. And as a group, they come up with such stupid ideas and make such stupid decisions because of pettiness, because of uh, uh, territoriality, because of, of, of envy, uh, because uh, uh, everyone's ego and you know, academia is filled with people who have, who have this terribly frustrating experience of, of, of writing down, you know, working so hard to write a paper that, that no one reads. Uh, so um, I, that all of that together creates a, an, an environment where, in some cases, not in all cases, but in some cases, the, the, uh, the whole is much stupider uh, than the sum of its smarts. So what is it that makes uh, uh, a group, what is it that makes a professional conversation such that it makes us smarter, and what are the things that make us less smart in some conversations where we'd prefer not to have had them at all? That's what I'm going to talk about here. That's why I think we need to care about teacher professional conversations. I should say a little bit about discourse. I say professional conversation or professional discourse. When I say discourse, it's just a, 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 another way for saying language and use, the way we talk to one another. Uh, discourse shapes what we can see, our gaze, uh, what we notice is important, distinguishing, for instance, figure from background. Uh, when we walk into a room like this, how we're able to make sense of it is part of the kind of categories that we have to think with. Uh, so for instance, to give you a, a local example, I'd never heard of and had no idea what geothermal activity was before I came to uh, Rotorua. And I, I actually walked around on the first day in a bit of a jet lag daze and having almost lost my life in the, in the uh, descent to uh, uh, the airport in the storm. And, um, and, and I saw all this, these kind of small smokestacks. I thought I was sure it was local. You know, everyone's running some sort of local heater. Uh, and only the next day did I realize that was geothermal activity. I did not have a category called geothermal activity, so I wasn't able to see it, the steam coming out of the ground. I wasn't able to see what was in front of my eyes and identify it correctly. So that's discourse. It shapes our gaze. It shapes what we're able to say, both in terms of what categories we have to speak with, but also in terms of the norms. But who can talk about what and who would people listen to? Uh, and what is thinkable, ultimately, if we don't have categories, if we don't have discourse, we can't think about these things. Of course, these aren't original ideas of mine. Uh, uh, I've put up some pictures of some of the people I admire in this field. Michel Foucault's written very persuasively on discourse. Charles Goodwin, if you haven't read his work on uh, professional vision, uh, I highly recommend one of the best articles I've ever read. Uh, Charles Goodwin, Professional Vision. Jan Blomert has a wonderful book on discourse. Any event, those are, if you want references, you can email me and I'll send them to you. Um, an example, a, a, what do you see? Here we have, I'll, I'll give you a hint, it's a, a chest x-ray. But what do you see in it? And what does a radiologist see? Anyone identify any uh, pathologies here? Any radiologists in the room? Well, here's what, here's what the radiologists see. I, of course, don't see it. But um, here we have a, a, a plural uh, fusion. Uh, and you can read the discourse. I, 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 you can see here what a rich technical vocabulary allows you to see things. And you can imagine that radiologists learn this over seeing thousands and thousands of chest x-rays and having them describe to them their professional vision as a radiologist is shaped by the sort of discourse they're immersed in, and then they're able to see things anew. Um, and if you want to know more about pleural effusion, you can go onto that website. So, a, a one last thing to say about professional conversations, I want to make a claim about learning, about teacher professional learning, and learning in general, uh, but especially <coughs> learning in the workplace. I, I want to claim that professional learning happens all the time, and we like to say learning happens all the time, we're lifelong learners. Uh, for good and for bad, uh, we can learn bad things, not just good things. We can learn uh, how to uh, teach poorly. We can learn how to be a bad colleague. We can learn uh, how to be a bad person, uh, how to do, how to be corrupt. Um, learning happens all the time for good or for bad as a consequence of engaging in the work and not as an event separate from the work. So uh, I don't know about New Zealand, but in Israel it's a pretty much accepted practice that you go off to teach your professional workshops which happen outside your school, outside of your, your, your team with uh, somebody who you've never met before and you won't meet again uh, who's talking about your work, but separate from your work. And those, uh, the research has suggested that most, mostly, uh, on average, these are incredibly ineffective ways of, of teaching people. 
Uh, it, we uh, tend to talk about our practice and engage in our practice differently when we're off-site and outside of the context of our work. And we learn the most when we're actually engaged in the sort of informal conversations and informal collaboration with colleagues, with students, uh, within the school. So, by the way, that means that what we're doing now, of course, is a highly ineffective uh, <laughs> teacher professional learning. Uh, I, I'm not saying that it's always that way, and I'm, I'm sure that the, the breakout sessions here will be great. Uh, but the most consequential learning you will engage in is what happens informally in school. And um, it, it, just by analogy, uh, in keeping with the medical analogy, I mean, this is what's called a clinical round, or at least this is some actors posing uh, uh, for a clinical round. Uh, in medicine, you have a practices, a, a routines, in which doctors work together to look at patients together. And here you have the patient lying between the doctors, and the doctors are pointing at various things and discussing, well, what do you think it could be if you check this, if you check that? And uh, together, learning from one another as part of doing the work. And this is the most consequential learning for doctors. But, you say, um, and, and you, you know, I'm sure you, some of you might have wanted to say, this teaching is different for medicine. Why are you bringing us all these medical analogies and you don't even know how to read a chest x-ray? Teaching is different for medicine for a number of reasons, and it's, it's worth thinking about them because these are things that, that pose challenges for our professional conversations. First of all, we teach alone, behind closed doors. We don't have that, um, that kind of uh, routine of working together. At least most of us are not, in Israel and England, are not fortunate enough to teach with colleagues. Uh, second of all, we can't easily pause our practice for consultation. We can pause after the lesson, but the most important kind of decisions we're making on an ongoing basis from moment to moment, what do I do with the, 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 you know, Johnny in the back there who's not paying attention? Do I put him on the spot? Do I go over, walk over to him and, and stand behind him? Do, you know, all these decisions, most of them we make as a matter of routine without thinking about them actively. We can't pause and say, okay, uh, let's get some colleagues together and talk about what we're doing. It's, it's a, in the heat of the moment, we need to make decisions, and that makes it uh, very different from medicine. Medicine's much easier, I think, uh, I haven't done it, than teaching. Um, teaching cannot be easily shared as an object for inquiry and discussion. We can't, uh, we don't have that, uh, that patient lying on the bed uh, uh, while we stand around and talk about him. Uh, so we're teaching behind the closed doors, we can't stop it, and we have this problem of how do we share it? How do we represent it in our conversations to have a discussion about it? Uh, mostly, it seems, we tell stories about it. Uh, but those stories are, 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 tend to be rather thin representations of the complexity of practice, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, most educational institutions are not designed to support collaboration and mutual learning. And again, I think it may be somewhat different in New Zealand, but in uh, Israeli context, you have very little time uh, that's uh, timetabled in where you can talk to colleagues and work together as a team. We don't have these you know, clinical rounds like you do in medicine. Uh, I know it's very different, say for instance, a place like Singapore where they have a lot of time for, for professional conversations. And even what's timetabled in, it turns out, isn't happening. Uh, and when it is happening, it's not happening to talk about, uh, about teaching and learning in the classroom. So uh, that, that's a, a serious problem. And finally, the norms that we've developed as a teaching profession, again, I know about Israel and, and England, uh, you tell me about New Zealand afterwards. The norms we have often do not support collaboration and mutual learning. Uh, often we have norms that do not make us smarter, they make us less smart about our work. So, um, just to give you an example of this, teacher informal learning, I'm going to show you a quick 90-second uh, 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 edited uh, clip from the, the movie uh, uh, The Class, uh, trailer more directed by Lauren Kamtat. Uh, and uh, we have here a new teacher, Frank, who, who's a history and geography teacher, arrives in a new school. By the way, great movie if you haven't seen it. Highly, highly recommended. Uh, I probably, um, well, Yoram says it's the best movie on, on schooling. I haven't seen as many as he has, uh, but highly recommended. What does Frank learn in the first hour at work? So I'm going to show you the uh, a clip from the movie, and I'm going to give you 45 seconds to talk to somebody, make it a professional conversation that makes you smarter. Uh, use the time wisely. Uh, so here's the uh, example. Okay. 45 seconds is really short, isn't it? <laughs> Um, I have a, a teacher I observed in England who would give 30 seconds to the, the pupils and, and just, they knew, 30 seconds was 30 seconds, it was amazing. I've never done that so short. Um, but uh, uh, normally at this point we have a conversation about it, but instead I'll tell you what, what, I, what I see 
uh, frank learning and, and add things on that Twitter feed or Google Doc or, or, or whatever uh, technologies you have that I'll, I'll look at afterwards. The first thing is we get categories. I was mentioning before, we, discourse is made up of categories that help us see the world. Here we have categories for how to think about pupils. So they're nice. They're nice, uh, but difficult. Uh, we have low expectations for them. We teach the multiplication tables, uh, sometimes mathematics. Um, we have categories of primarily uh, nice and not nice. Uh, and you need to watch out for the not nice ones. Uh, so you can think about all sorts of other categories. We might have categories that are more clinical, uh, which we don't hear here about uh, learning disabilities, about uh, uh, learning about approaches to learning, about motivations. You might have uh, uh, categories about knowledge, about, uh, 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 about home background, about, um, we can think of lots of ways to describe pupils, but in this school, at least based on this 90 second clip you saw, the chief categories are in terms of nice or not nice, and in terms of low expectations, which actually we have for everyone. We have categories for teachers, did you notice? Uh, the main category for teachers is how long you've managed to stay at the school. So those of them who are, and, and I cut out some of them just to, to save time, but there's one who's nearing retirement. Everyone is in awe of this person who's managed to spend so much time in the school. Four years in the school, people are impressed. Yeah, four years, good for you. Uh, and the new teacher who said, I, I'm pleased to be coming in for the suburbs to finally be in the, in the inner city. Everyone kind of uh, looks at him with a, amusement. Uh, and I'm sure that he picks up on these these messages. So, so we have something about what it means to be a teacher in this school. It's a fight for survival because we have some not nice students who have, and we have very low expectations for them. All of this informal learning is taking place outside of uh, uh, professional development workshops, outside of, uh, uh, of the sort of formal staff meetings in which they're talking about teaching and learning. Yet I think it's incredibly consequential for uh, what happens in, uh, in school. One thing you, you might think about in terms of your own schools or what sort of informal conversations are we having? When do we get together to talk about students, about learning, about curriculum, about what it means to be a teacher? And what goes on in those conversations? Um, and, I'll, and I'll talk about uh, what goes on in conversations in Israel and England in a moment. Um, in fact, I've gotten to that point there. So I've talked about why we should care about teacher professional conversations. I've talked primarily about the, you know, what, what it, some conversations make us smarter, some make us less smart, about the importance of discourse, which shapes what we can see, what we can think, what we can say, and about the importance of discourse in, in, in formal professional learning on the job as part of uh, being a part of school culture. And now we'll talk about what, what do we talk about when we talk about our practice. And here I'm going to present 10 informal rules governing teacher professional discourse. I actually have more than 10, uh, but I thought 10 is a, is a nice even number, 10 commandments you could call them of uh, teacher professional discourse. And if you download the slides, you can see uh, uh, number 11 that I thought maybe I'd get to, maybe not. I won't get to it, but I'll give you an incentive to look at the slides, see all the bits that I didn't put into the talk. So rule number one, don't talk about pedagogical problems. Uh, here's a quote from Judith Warren Little in a very important article called The Persistence of Privacy. Uh, she says that school teaching has endured, lar endured largely as an assemblage of entrepreneurial individuals whose autonomy is grounded in norms of privacy and non-interference and is sustained by the very organization of teaching work. And what, and what she means by that is that it's built into schooling that we work alone, as we said before, teaching behind closed doors. But it's not just teaching behind closed doors, there are norms of privacy that you, you don't let people in. And it's, it's considered to be very impolite to go into someone's classroom. Uh, and when you do end up in their classroom to say things about their practice, everyone, uh, there's an expectation of non-interference. And it's sustained by the very organization of work. It's sustained by the timetable, uh, by the design of teaching teams, and, and by the organizational culture. Um, and so as a result, talk about classroom practice. And this is, again, based on my own and other people's research in Israel and England and the United States, it tends to be first and foremost, this is especially true in Israel, about ventilation, letting off steam, geothermal activity that takes place within teachers' souls as they deal with those not nice students uh, 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 who are difficult to teach. And so you might have in an Israeli uh, staff room a teacher coming in and during the break and saying, I can't, you can't believe what you know, Yossi did today. Uh, you know, he, he threw the chair out the window, he, 
he hit uh, somebody else, he yelled at me, it was, you know, complaining about students, when this is talking about a pedagogical problem, but it's not talking about it in order to solve it, and, and typically the, the, the response would be one of consolation, well, you think Yossi's bad, you should meet Itzik in my year three class. Uh, and, and, and then you have what, what uh, Ilana horn Seidel calls normalization of problems of practice. So we have problems, but we, we console one another and we normalize them. We, we basically say, yeah, it's okay you have a problem. Don't worry about it. We all have problems. Don't worry. They're, it's perfectly normal. Nothing to be concerned about. Uh, which is, of course, not a very good way of, it may be good for making someone feel like they're not alone, but it's not very useful in terms of teaching them how to, uh, and helping them co cope with their problems. And we do share material. So uh, the main form of, of dealing with pedagogical problems is, you know, coming in in the morning, does anyone have a worksheet for uh, whatever, and uh, getting some materials uh, that, that you can then use in your classroom. Uh, so that's the first rule. Don't talk about pedagogical problems. Second is, mind, don't mind the gap between teaching aspirations and classroom realities. And I think it's, it's really interesting uh, to, to look at the, um, you know, Derek mentioned that the gap between espoused and, and, uh, and uh, explicit, and, uh, enacted, espoused and enacted uh, theories. And, uh, and you could see that gap between the ideologies that most of you are individuationists <coughs> ideologically in terms of your commitment, but you work in schools in which practice is much more socializationist and acculturationist. Um, one of the things that, that we find is that people very often, there's a huge gap between the way we talk about practice and what actually happens in the classroom. Uh, I have here as an example from a book that uh, Roxy Harris and I wrote based on research that Roxy and, and Ben Rampton and Constant Lung did at King's College London, in which it, we, uh, audio, we audio recorded uh, children in middle schools in London, uh, secondary schools in London, and you get a real different sense of what's going on in the classroom when you put a radio microphone on, on a child and you can hear what's going on in that child's world while the teacher's in his own world teaching. And what we found is that there's a, a completely different a, sort of classroom regime or interactional settlement is what Roxy and, and uh, Ben Rampton call it, uh, in which the, 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 the teacher's voice is no longer dominant in the classroom, at least if you listen to these radio, uh, vo uh, the radio mic recordings. To give you an idea of what you can hear, you can hear the, the kids talking constantly, undermining what the teacher's saying, challenging the teacher, singing songs or humming songs, sharing sweets in the back, um, uh, watching porn on the internet. I mean, there are all sorts of things that are going on, uh, uh, and you get a very, very different view. Um, and in the official version of what's going on in English classrooms is the teacher is in control. And if the teacher is not in control, the teacher is doing something wrong. And we show, we, li we played these recordings back to focus groups of, uh, um, uh, I can't remember the number of teachers, but it was a total of 520 uh, hour, uh, years of teaching experience within all the focus groups. And the initial instincts was to say, that teacher's not doing their job well. That teacher shouldn't, you know, in, in some cases, that teacher should be fired. That, that person shouldn't be teaching. He should be doing collaborative work groups. He should be doing, he should be punishing them. He should be doing this, he should be doing that. And then as we played another one, and another one, another one, they began to say, well, actually, it's kind of like that in my classroom. So think about that. Think about that state of mind, where you think, well, I'm, it's not right, but it's what I'm doing. Uh, and when you talk about what you're doing, you're in this constant sense of kind of schizophrenia, as, as you all called it before, where we don't talk honestly. Very often we don't talk honestly about our practice. Uh, because we're used to not talking about our practice in certain ways. We're used to talking about our aspirations rather than our practice when we get together to talk about our practice ostensibly. And I also think there's an element of kind of assuming, well, it's got to be better in other people's classrooms. Uh, it's only me, uh, it's for me, I, this is clearly how I felt as a teacher. I was a horrible teacher when it came to classroom management. And it's, it's only me who's experiencing these troubles. But now I know, having gone into other people's classrooms, it's actually all of us, but we never spoke about it. Uh, so there's this kind of institutional conspiracy of silence around what's actually going on in our classrooms. And we talk instead about our aspirations. So uh, makes it really difficult to have uh, uh, professional conversations which are useful. Again, uh, you should let me know on Twitter or the Google Doc or whatever what it's like in, in New Zealand. Rule number three, dichotomize. Um, we have a tendency, and this has been going on for 100 years, uh, uh, more than 100 years, to dichotomize educational ideological issues. And here, perhaps, I, I, I'm slightly different in my attitude than, 
than your, um, at least than your arms talk this morning. Uh, we, we talk about the old versus the new education, teacher-centered versus child-centered, individuation versus socialization, knowledge transmission versus development of thinking, achievement outcomes versus values education. These are the big ones in Israel. External control and, and discipline uh, versus intrinsic motivation and interest. Content versus process. I could go on. Uh, we tend to do this in the whole field. You have there that picture with the Hebrew is a recent very, very important book in Israel where, where she divides education along all these lines of uh, new versus old. And I hear it a lot here also, you know, future oriented versus living in the past. Uh, but actually, um, first of all, if this has been going on for over 100 years, to talk about the new education and the old education, then what do we mean by future-oriented versus living in the past? Because uh, 100 years ago, they were talking about future-oriented in the same ways that a lot of us are talking about it here. Uh, but more importantly, uh, I, I think all underlying each of these dichotomies is a more complicated situation in which each side of the dichotomy is actually dependent on the other. There is no culture without individuals engaging in it. There is no individual without culture. Okay, so this whole conflict between at least individuation and acculturation is, is highly problematic. And so we may have these ideologies which we're committed to, uh, but when you get down into the nitty gritty of practice, I would contend uh, that, that they don't play out in the way that in these sort of pure forms. Uh, and um, so that's rule number three, dichotomize. And I think to, to get really smart about uh, teaching, we need to get beyond uh, these somewhat simplistic dichotomies. Rule number four, trust your own unique experience. So here we have two teachers, and you're going to see them quite a bit throughout. Um, one of them, by the way, is a man. Um, I wasn't able to find a, a good caricature of a man and a woman, but one of them is a man. Uh, maybe you should try, says the first teacher, about to suggest something to the other one. And the other one says, well, that, yeah, that may work well for you, but my class is different. And it's true. We all have different classroom cultures, different classroom environments, different students. We all have our own unique individual styles of teaching. But actually, there's quite a lot which is common. And if we're all radically unique, then there's nothing to learn from one another. Uh, now, we're not all radically unique, actually. I can tell you that because I do research in classrooms, and there are a lot of things which are pretty constant. Um, so there are differences here and there. You have some teachers who are more authoritarian, some who are more permissive. You have some classrooms where they get along well, some where they don't get along, different levels of knowledge, different styles. But ultimately, there, there are a lot of things that, that are pretty constant, and there's a lot to learn from one another. Not that necessarily what works for one will work for the other, but we have a lot more to learn from each other than we think. And if you only learn from your own experience, then you have to make all the mistakes by yourself. And you can't learn from other people's mistakes as well. Very, very uh, subversive idea, uh, which is a norm in many, many teacher professional conversations I've uh, engaged in and, and have documented. A, rule number five, we, ha we lack a precise, precise professional, uh, professional language. Um, so this is a quote from Philip Jackson, Life in Classrooms. Uh, it's 1990, but I think the book was originally written in the 1960s, 1968. He says, one of the most notable features of teacher talk is the absence of a technical vocabulary. Unlike professional encounters between doctors, there they are again. Uh, lawyers, garage mechanics, and astrophysicists, when teachers talk together, almost any reasonably intelligent adult can listen in and comprehend what is being said. Now, this is not an invitation to obfuscate. Uh, this is not, we shouldn't develop jargon that people can't understand. I think it's a, it's a virtue to be able to communicate. But we have lots of uh, terms which are rather imprecise. Uh, so when we talk about students being interested, being motivated, you know, there are lots of different forms of motivation. Uh, and, what, and, the, and the differences between being motivated because one wants to fulfill oneself or being motivated because one's afraid of being punished or being motivated because one wants to perform better than somebody else uh, or fear of being outperformed, these are very different forms of motivation, yet we don't talk about those different types of motivation. We talk about students being engaged and motivated and interested, understanding, uh, the, uh, very, very wishy-washy term. What does it mean to understand something? There are lots of different ways to understand. It's not, they're not all the same. Uh, and, and other terms which are more mystical, like, you know, I could tell by the sparkle in their eyes that they really got it. 
uh, well, very difficult to, to uh, have a professional conversation where, where we're using terms like this, and that's a real challenge uh, for uh, professional conversations. Developing a common language which is shared, we know what we're saying, we know what we mean, and is also precise, we know what we're talking about. Um, I'm going to talk now about five, the next five rules. These are, these, I do a lot of working with teachers uh, and researchers uh, looking at video recordings of practice. And we talk a lot about video recordings. And I think there are some five rules that are very, very specific to the way we talk about video recordings. And I want to talk about them now. Uh, first of all, hyper-criticize. Um, and I'll give you an example here. This is a, a feedback conversation from uh, uh, the uh, UK Teachers TV program. Anyone seen Teachers TV? The Teaching Challenge? Oh, you should really look it up on YouTube. The Teachers TV is now defunct, but it's a wonderful program. They bring in celebrities to go teach for an hour, and, and they have a terrible time of it. Of course they have a terrible time, because teaching is incredibly complicated, and it makes us all feel good to see famous uh, politicians and radio personalities fail in what we do uh, well. And, and then they have a feedback conversation where the teacher is normally with the class and who watches on closed circuit TV while the celebrity teaches, then gives the celebrity feedback. I'm going to show you uh, 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 some excerpts from a conversation between Tony Robinson, who's a comedian and actor who's trying his hand at teaching for the first time, uh, receives feedback from the, uh, uh, the regular teachers, the subject coordinator for, the, for that school. Uh, he's teaching history. And I'm going to ask you what's happening and why, and is this situation familiar to you? So here we go. It's, it's, just, it's not the whole conversation, but you'll get the gist of it from what, what I have here. Well, Tony, that's, that's the lesson done. Okay. Um, so uh, again, a few comments uh, of mine on this, uh, this bit. Um, I, I mean, he's hypercritical uh, Colin. Uh, he's got a long, long list of uh, things that uh, Tony was doing wrong. Very, very judgmental, very, you know, determined he knows what's right, what's wrong, and he's just going to, to, to put it out there. Uh, Tony comes away actually broken. You don't see the whole thing, but he's got a terrible experience of it. Um, and, and what's interesting is that Tony actually had a, had a kind of an inquiry stance toward it. He wanted to, to have a conversation about to try to make sense of what, what are the possibilities, what's going on, what's not. But, but there was, that was completely shut down by this hypercritical stance. Now, this happens rarely face to face uh, because uh, you know, people are, are, are typically not as uh, anxious to show uh, the teacher that they did something wrong. Like here, I mean, you can really sense the competition between them. Colin's really out there to show Tony that he doesn't know how to teach, and maybe a bit threatened by him because he actually did know how to work the crowd pretty well, and he had to get the kids completely engaged. Um, and there again, that, that wishy-washy word. Um, but, the, the, uh, it, but even when, you know, when it's not the teacher in front of you, when you're looking at video recordings, we have this tendency to go uh, into a very, very critical, here's what he should have done, here's what she should have done, uh, that's wrong, uh, instead of trying to make sense of, well, what, you know, we can, let's assume that the kids are all make sense. You know, they, they are, what they're doing makes sense, and the teachers all make sense. You know, it's incredible how we make these assumptions about kids. Let's all try to understand the kids, but when we come to, to criticizing teaching, we come to try to understand teaching, we, we throw all that out the door, and we, you know, we assume the teacher doesn't know what, what she's doing, or he's doing. So, um, that's uh, rule number... Um, uh, six hyper criticize and um, oh, did I skip one? Oh, I think I, I think there were ten, but I may have the numbering off. Fo rule number eight: focus on what's missing uh, rather than what's present. And this is really related to the issue of hyper criticism. Uh, very often, teachers will talk about what should have the teacher should have done uh, rather than what actually happened. And this. And this causes us to have the sort of conversations which are terribly unhelpful because they're speculative. So teachers say things like, you know, a collaborative learning task would have been better here, and in such a case I would have preferred if the teacher had, had given them some time to, to, to do the work independently, and if she'd given it a chance to answer, it would have led to a really, really great uh, discussion. But we can't actually have a conversation about that because we don't have any evidence about what would have happened had the teacher done something else, and here we're just trading our kind of pedagogical preferences. Uh, whereas, if we were actually to focus on what's going on in the video recording, 
we might get on to, uh, uh, to a much more fruitful and productive conversation. We might understand things differently. Uh, so that's uh, rule number eight. Rule number nine, trust your feelings and intuition. No need to justify or provide evidence. And this happens all the time in my teaching. I, I teach a, a lot of courses with teachers where I'm trying to, to teach uh, sort of sociolinguistic techniques of analyzing uh, uh, classroom interaction and discourse. And, and one teacher will say the children were really engaged, note the sparkle in their eyes. And the other will say, I felt that they were bored. And they will agree to disagree because there's no way to, uh, to figure this out. You know, it's sort of, but we, I have a feeling that this is what's going on. Well, I, I have a feeling that's what's going on. And, uh, what can we do with that? Well, I think we can never know with certainty what's going on, but there's a lot of evidence that we can rely upon to try to build a persuasive argument. And, uh, and the first thing we need to do in order to do that is to leave our, our feelings and our intuition off to the side and, and to, to really work with uh, uh, the arguments and the, and the evidence. Um, yeah, there we go, each to our own. Uh, rule number 10, everything is attributable to the teacher. Uh, we often adopt a rather teacher-centered interpretation of classroom practice, attributing the teacher almost magical powers to shape events. And in such a way, we overlook the other influences that shape and constrain teachers' actions. So pupils shape teaching no less than teachers do. Likewise, policy, curriculum, architecture, timetable, and assessment. Uh, and this is, this is something which, I, I mean, very often uh, you'll, you'll have a group of teachers and other educators looking at, at uh, an unruly classroom and they'll say, well, yeah, a teacher doesn't know how to manage the classroom, but actually the kids have a lot more control over what's going on there than the teacher does. Uh, and we need to understand that. The kids, have a lot more, the kids have a lot more control over what we do than we have over what they do. Uh, even the teacher is dominating the classroom. They're dominating the classroom because the kids are forcing them to very often. Now, I'm not saying we should, you know, teacher has no responsibility. And of course, we focus on the teacher in order uh, because the teacher is responsible for what's going on. They're getting paid uh, to be there rather than be coerced to be there. Uh, but, um, it, but still, it, there's a sense of uh, that we need to understand classroom interaction as interaction, as being shaped both by the teacher and by all these other contextual factors. And when we understand that, we may be a little more understanding of the difficulties of teaching and of the complicated nature of teaching and of the fact that, that sometimes things that in theory might work really well in, in practice uh, uh, don't uh, pan out so well. So those are the, the, the rules, the 10 rules that, um, that I've observed as informal rules in professional conversations. Again, mostly in the US where there's a lot of research in the UK and in Israel. And, um, and we've talked about, uh, uh, that's what we talk about when we talk about our practice. And, and I hope it's clear to you how difficult it makes us to be smart when that's the way we're talking about our practice. So I want to now talk about what sort of professional conversations uh, make us smarter about our practice and, and why should, you know, what, what can you take from that? So I want to uh, uh, offer some alternative rules. First of all, we need to focus on the core work of teaching, our classroom practice. So uh, obviously there are administrative things to do in teacher team meetings and work groups. There are uh, announcements that need to be made. There, there are all sorts of other things that need to happen. Uh, but we should spend most of our time focusing on the core work of teaching, which is what happens in the classroom. Second, we need to anchor our discourse, anchor our conversations to rich representations of practice and base claims on evidence from them. Um, excuse the typo. The uh, a, a one a, a rich representation of practice, of course, is video, which is what I've been doing a lot of work on, but also on student work, also on uh, you know, conducting focus groups with, with students, uh, doing very careful uh, observations of, others teacher, uh, of one another's teaching, even looking at, at, at lesson plans and the actual tasks which are being given gives us a better representation than just telling a story about what's happening. The richer the representation of practice, the deeper the conversation can be. Uh, adopt an inquiry stance, describe and understand before attempting to judge and solve. Uh, I think this is really key uh, because it, 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 this kind of leap toward trying to solve people's problems very often isn't helpful. If we, have, if we offer solutions which aren't based on a good understanding of the problem, then those solutions aren't going to be very helpful. Uh, and so very often when a colleague has a problem, they don't want to be consoled, or maybe they do want to be consoled, but it's not going to help them much. And they don't, not necessarily want advice, um, though they may think they want advice. Really what they need to do is have a conversation first and foremost to try to understand the problem and only after that to try to solve it. And I'm not saying there's no space for criticism, there's no space for judgment. There certainly is, and if there's no room for criticism, then we go into this kind of 
contrived collegiality that Andrea Hargaves talks about. But we need to balance it, and, and description and understanding need to come before judgment and solution. Balance criticism and support, and, and be honest about it. Uh, it doesn't help anyone to, to skirt around the difficult issues. And finally, focus on issues and dilemmas and move between specific instances and general uh, principles. Uh, uh, Derek mentioned my book Bet uh, with Julia Snell, Better Than Best Practice. The, the idea of this title, in the UK, everyone's talking about best practice, as if there's one best practice that will solve all our problems. And what we claim is that, that focusing on problems, on issues, on dilemmas, is actually better than best practice because it helps develop one's judgment. Uh, so, uh, so good advice uh, can only take you so far. Uh, and I'm saying there, there is space for that, of course, but much better than good advice is to try to, to develop one's judgment by looking at dilemmas, by looking at principled issues, by looking at the underpinning problems that, that shape those, those manifestations in the classroom. So I'm gonna give you a brief example. It's a recording from a small primary school in a small coastal town in Israel. It, staff with very progressive educational approach that emphasize learning out of intrinsic motivation. They're very individuationist, but they have a problem. They had a, a, a difficult class, a difficult first grade class that no one was able to manage. And so in the summer, they brought in a new teacher. It's a, it's a, a growing school. Each year they add a new class, so they were able to bring on a new teacher who's experienced in the behavior analysis approach, which is a behavior modification approach, very, very behaviorist, very, very externally controlling through a lot of praise and a lot of, sort of uh, um, signs that the teacher uses, eyes on me, uh, straight, uh, sit sensibly, that sort of thing. And, um, and there was a lot of tension in the staff room over classroom management rules and their enforcement. The new teacher was doing very well in that classroom, was succeeding. Uh, but it wasn't successful when other teachers went into our classroom because they weren't using her technique. And basically she wanted the whole school to talk the same language and to enforce the same rules in the same way. And the other teachers thought that she was uh, you know, a bit of militarist, uh, Pavlovian, uh, uh, not doing education, doing training. And, uh, and they had, uh, 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 this is a big issue over the course of the year. Fortunately for them and for us, they joined a research project in which we uh, did a series of post-observation professional conversations. Researcher, uh, and I'd like to acknowledge her, Rotem Trachtenberg, who's working with me on this, went into the lessons, videotaped the lessons while they observed one another, would talk to the teachers after the lesson about what they, uh, what they were concerned about, what issues they felt were worth talking about. She would then edit the videotape and bring it back to them and they would watch it together and talk about it. We had 21 conversations that we videotaped uh, the lesson and then they had those conversations over the course of the year. Out of 21 conversations, 11 of them were about this issue. So it was a big issue in the classroom, in, in, the, in the staff room. And I'm gonna show you, um, I'm gonna show you some, a, an example from one of their conversations. Uh, first of all, uh, just to point out, this is not a new problem. I mentioned before these dichotomies have been going on for a long time. Uh, John Dewey's writing precisely about this uh, tension between external control and internal intrinsic motivation in 1902. Um, and here you are. The principal observes the art teacher teaching. Uh, uh, during the course of, of the lesson, there are a lot of cases which the children aren't listening. And the principal's trying to understand how she manages the class. Uh, and you'll, you'll, I've, I've, you, you won't understand it if I play it for you, so I've, I've translated it and I will read it out, uh, their conversation, parts of the conversation. So it, while they're watching the video, the principal says to, to the teacher, oh, I got, the, I got it reversed here. Uh, that should be the principal says, most are listening to you. I'm not sure Meital was listening now, uh, was Ben. Look, uh, I'll tell you. And then they stop the video. He says, let's say this part, when they stop listening, and he's about to ask, he's about to tell her what he thinks. And then he says, well, what do you think about that? And she says, well, I think there will always be some children who listen and other children who don't. Okay. Uh, it's important that those who are listening receive some kind of response. Uh, so I'm going to teach that part of the class. As for those who aren't listening, we should try to interest them, to grab their attention, but we also need to let it go. They likely can't contain so much, and it's okay. You can't force them. So they, while well, the principal interrupts her, I, I wanted to say, I mean, uh, to suggest the other alternative, Noah's method, this is the behavior modification approach. Uh, you know, eyes on me, there's absolute science in the classroom. So it continues. She says, well, sometimes I do that, uh, but sometimes I understand that they've had enough of me. They're sick of me. They can't listen to me anymore, and that's all right. Interesting, says the principal. 
They can't all be, you know, they're not soldiers, like really, that's what I think. Uh, you're saying that the people doesn't want to listen to you right now. No, and it's okay. He'll cope with it if he misses something, some information. He'll know how to reach me. Interesting, okay. Uh, the whole class doesn't have to be the same. I mean, I hope you can hear the ideologies that you're always talking about this morning. Very clear individuationist ideology. Uh, with a lot of respect for individual self-determination and freedom to decide when they want to learn and when they don't want to, to regulate their own learning. So a little later in the conversation, uh, the teacher uh, says, you know, I, I feel the children are able from within themselves, intrinsically, to choose to listen. And not because I'm standing there telling them, and she knocks on the table three times. Um, cool, I understand, and it's a lofty ambition. And it happens, she says, you know, because he's kind of saying, well, it's a lofty ambition, but it doesn't happen. He says, yeah, it happens, yes. I can tell you about the process I went through, his own learning experience with Noah, that behavior modification teacher. I mean, with Noah's approach, at first it made my skin crawl. I couldn't speak that language. I also don't know how to say it in her words, okay? I'm not Noah. I can't say I praise you, I don't like it, but I have adopted aspects of it. Now when I enter a class, I know how to achieve attentiveness. Now everyone, eyes on me, sit straight. It's a bit coercive and extrinsic, Pavlovian, as you call it. They continue. But it serves my purposes, and I don't think it harms the kids much. I mean, the proportion is important, and so is the music, the tone. Uh, so I invite you to consider expanding your, your repertoire. Apply. Of course, I'm especially, a, well, because I'm the sort of person who's interested in freedom, so I listen to other things. So this is part of a very long conversation. Uh, and I, I give you 45 seconds to uh, critique it. Uh, is it a good professional conversation? In what ways? <laughs> Moving on. I'm dying to know what you think, but I have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to tell you what I think instead. And I really would encourage you to tell me what you think afterwards. Um, I showed this to a group of Israeli teachers uh, just before I got on the plane, more or less, and, um, and they did not agree with my interpretation. Um, I think they're wrong, uh, but uh, it was interesting. I'll tell you what they thought also, put their voices here uh, as well. And, um, and so here's the, some of the things. I think it's a great conversation. Uh, and I, of course, had the privilege of having listened to a lot of these conversations, uh, including with the principal and Noah, including with Bar, the, the art teacher and Noah, so you know, we see the whole, the whole context. Uh, first of all, they're directly and honestly coping with a painful pedagogical topic. This is dividing the staff room, and they're putting it on the table, and they're directly uh, addressing it, bravely, I would say. It's grounded in actual classroom practice. They're looking at the video. They can't hide from it. They can't say, well, yeah, everyone listens to me, and those who aren't listening are quietly working. It's painfully clear that those uh, uh, pupils that the, the principal was talking about are just not part of this conversation. They're not part of the classroom, and they're interfering with other people as well. And so so that, that becomes the trigger which, which forces them to confront the reality of their practice. By the way, I've seen conversations uh, where they completely avoided really painful topics that are, are, are visible there in front of them on the, on the video. So it's not a, it, a cure-all, but it, it at least helps ground uh, these conversations. It, they adopt an inquiry stance. They're questioning and exchanging ideas rather than evaluating. And I think it's, 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 uh, uh, that we, we need to develop this kind of leadership style uh, that this principle has, I call it deliberative leadership. I'm not sure it exists in the literature, though, calling the leadership literature, everything exists. Um, and deliberative leadership, he, he really isn't sure. He's really not sure about what he thinks about this topic. You can hear him take the very opposite side, the very opposite approach when he talks to, to Noah. He, he asks her, you know, well, what, what happens when you leave the classroom? Why is it that the kids aren't behaving well when other teachers come in? Because you're not helping them uh, acquire habits that, that, you know, values that they've internalized. They're doing it externally. So it's of no use. It's not education. It's, you know, so, so he, he adopts both sides, and he's really searching for, for solutions, both for the school and for his own practice. And he's inviting the, the, the teachers into this process of deliberating together with him. I think it, very often we think about leaders, strong leaders, knowing what they want to do, having a clear vision. And, and that, that actually doesn't, uh, very often, may not cause the sort of professional conversations that are worth having. So uh, I think there's a lot to be said about his leadership here. Uh, issue and dilemma focused, and it considers the underlying principles. They get into the real nitty gritty of uh, what are our goals here, how are we achieving them. It's not about the technique. Uh, it's, about, it's about human nature, about the processes, about time, about 
uh, about the, the underlying principles, and it's, it's grounded in, the, in the, uh, the specific dilemmas they're facing. Do I say something to those children who are disrupting me or ignore them, as, as Barr suggests? And it's supportive, yet very challenging at the same time. Uh, he, I, didn't, I cut out the bit where he goes on and on about what a great teacher she is and makes her really embarrassed. Um, and it's reciprocal. There, it's not one person giving the other one feedback. Even though he's the principal and he clearly has uh, uh, the, the authority, he dominates the conversation in many ways. Uh, but, but he's open to hearing what she has to say, and, and he talks about his own experiences. It's not just about her teaching, uh, it's also about his teaching, and there's a high level of reciprocity there. Uh, the Israeli teachers who saw it they thought that he was way too dominating. It wasn't real good professional conversation because it wasn't dialogic enough. He was far too dominant, far too aggressive with his own opinion. I actually, I disagree with them, but that's something we can have a, a conversation about afterwards. Uh, advancing teacher learning through professional conversations. Well, what, what should you do? And I'm arriving at the end of the talk. Um, first of all, uh, there, there, I'm going to talk about five challenges. And these are the challenges we're trying to meet in our work in Israeli schools right now. Um, the, the first one is an organizational one. Creating teams that have a shared object. This is really important. Very often we create task forces that don't have a shared object of teaching. So, you know, a, a literature teacher with a math teacher, with a physical education teacher, and they talk about some a, a topic which is of concern to the school, but it's not about their core work of teaching because they have nothing in common in their core work of teaching. Uh, so regular teams with a shared object for regular meetings with lots of time. Uh, it's surprising how difficult it is in many schools to make that happen. Uh, creating uh, the culture. Uh, productive discourse norms through norms, through protocols, through modeling, through reflection. One of the things we're doing in Israeli schools now is we're recording these conversations and we're playing them back to the coordinators, to the teachers, and, and getting them talking about, well, how do we talk about our practice and how can we make it better? We're also developing protocols. Uh, there are lots of them out there. We're just adapting them to the Israeli context for how do you talk about your practice? And it, sometimes we need those, those kind of uh, uh, rules that help dictate the way we, we talk in order to develop the cultural norms. We don't need to invent everything on our own. A representation, you have to make practice available for inquiry. Uh, I'm a firm believer in video recordings, uh, documenting student work. There are other methods, as I mentioned. A, a leadership, uh, which I talked about a minute ago. Uh, and it's a unique set of skills and dispositions. Someone who's a really good teacher is not necessarily a really good uh, coordinator of teacher professional uh, conversations and, and the, the fact that you have experience or, or, or you're really committed or passionate doesn't mean you have these skills and doesn't mean uh, uh, that you can't become better at it if we give attention to it and, and work on it. So that's one of the things we're doing in Israel now is we're, we're working with coordinators across uh, schools trying to help them think about how to manage these conversations. And of course, the same principles apply to them. So we're bringing in rich representations of their professional conversations with their teachers uh, for joint inquiry. And finally, uh, we need a systemic approach. We need to look at career trajectories, uh, who becomes a coordinator, what incentives do we have for them to do that job well, support systems to help them learn how to do that job. The system, at least in Israel, is not designed for that right now, and that's one of the biggest problems. So uh, a lot of challenges. It's not easy, but I think it's well worth thinking about. I think it's well worth doing, and I think if we uh, engage in these sort of professional conversations I've described, we will all become smarter about our practice and, and, and enjoy it more as well. Um, so I hope to continue this conversation with you all. <laughs> Uh, you have my uh, email address here, and I'd love to hear from you. I'm, we're still at the conference until Friday, so uh, please track me down and, and talk to me about it. I'd love to hear what you think. Thank you very much.